This is the Born to Be podcast, where we believe you were created on purpose and for a purpose. Each week, we deliver inspiration and interviews with today's top thought leaders who are living out their unique calling every single day. Are you ready to discover your true identity and become who you were born to be? The future is yet to be created. And now, here's your host, Darren Earlywine. back to the Born to Be podcast with your host, Darren Earlywine. So stoked you guys joined us again. You know, a lot of times I think, guys, you may hear somebody's story, you may meet somebody, maybe they're uh, they're really making it happen. Uh, maybe they're an entrepreneur, they're a pioneer, they're somebody who have started a business, or maybe you didn't even know they started it, but you see their life and you, you, you maybe are envious and you see their success and you think, oh my gosh, that person must have been born with a silver spoon in their mouth. I bet they don't have any problems. And you can begin to feel inadequate, like, I've got issues, I've got struggles, I've got family stuff, and there's no way that God could have a plan for my life the way he has with them. And that's one of the reasons we love to tell you guys stories and bring people to uh, the Born to Be podcast who uh, have stepped into who God has uh, created them to be and have overcome great things. And honestly, every single one of us has have a different story. And uh, the common factor I find so often is pain, is struggle, and the way that God brings us through that. And one of our long-term partners uh, here at Blackbird uh, started with our connection with pub theology is Scott and Nyla Wolf. And Scott and Nyla own uh, Wolfie's Grill uh, here in Indianapolis or, uh, area. Uh, you guys now have six locations? Six locations, yep. Five Wolfies and uh, the Italian House in Westfield. Yep. Six restaurants. And if you don't know the restaurant industry, uh, you love to go eat at restaurants, I'm sure. What you may not know is that having a long-term successful restaurant this, the odds are not in your favor for that. It's a very, <laughs> very difficult industry uh, to have continuity, to have su- success in. And Scott, you and Nyla have uh, to have six restaurants in one city that are all growing, that are developing, uh, speaks to your leadership and just God's blessing in your life. But uh, I know your guys' story. We've told it multiple times at Pub Theology, and I'm so excited to have you guys in the podcast because uh, it is not a this was, you know, destined to be kind of story. This Your life started out in... I'm guessing if I could interview like 15 year old Scotty Wolf yep. and tell you what your life was going to be, you would probably would have said, "There's no way that's possible." Absolutely, absolutely. Well, let's jump into it, Scott. Okay. Nyla, welcome, Nyla. We're glad you're here because I mean you're obviously the brains of the of the entire situation, <laughs> and so uh, you can keep Scott in the straight and narrow. Yep. And uh, one thing we'll get into that I love is it's not just about you guys. One of the things that I think is also unique is the way that your whole family is really a part of what you guys are creating as Absolutely. far yeah. as a culture in the restaurants and everything that's going on with, with Wolfies and, and beyond. So, but Scott, let's start with you. Uh, as a kid, did you, like, I mean, let's just ask that, did you dream like one day I'm going to own a chain of restaurants and this will be my deal when you were seven, eight years old? No, no clue. Matter of fact, uh, you know, I was one of those kids kind of free and, and running and just played around. It was, I was from a small town and, uh, no, no real goals, just, you know, survival mode. And, you know, kind of, you know, we've talked about these things and, you know, uh, I grew up in a small town and, um, you know, I was raised Catholic, nothing wrong with Catholic. You know, I learned a lot from that, but it was one of those that, you know, I, at my venture and my time at, you know, with Catholicism was, I knew more about, you know, Mary, Joseph, the apostles, than I really knew about Jesus Christ. Sure. And so, um, I never had that personal relationship. And uh, so those are, that's one of the things that um, at a young age, you know, as I grew up when I was 14 years old, um, and, you know, I'll just kind of venture into my, my story. Yeah. Um, I, uh, surprising to us, my father had passed away. Mm-hmm. And uh, we all thought he'd live on forever. And, and uh, I think my mom knew, but he had died from cancer at the age of 14. Did you and, and you guys didn't know he was battling cancer? We the kids, the siblings, none of us knew. He hid it from us, and and we never knew it. And a week later, you know, he was sick. Went in the hospital. A week later, he passed away. And yeah. and we knew my mom knew, but she, you know, I think they both agreed that you know what, we're just going to let this ride and see how it goes. So how many other sisters did you have, Scott? We've got four siblings. Okay. So I've got uh, an older sister and then two older brothers. I'm I'm the baby, so I was. Uh, I think I was an oops. You know, I yeah. they were all two years apart, and yeah. I ended up being like almost five years <laughs> yeah. behind yeah. them all. So I was. I was really the little one in the, the 
family. So, so do you feel like that when when your dad passed, do you think your your older siblings maybe had a little more idea as well? And as a fourteen year old, just it wasn't on your radar. Did your parents hold, hide it pretty well? You know what? Um, I know my next kin. You know, Steve, my brother, uh, five years older than me. He had no clue because we were both shocked. I mean, my mom at this time was bedridden. She was she was battling uh, multiple sclerosis. Wow. So my dad would take care of her. And uh, so when he got sick, I remember my mom looked at me and my brother and just said, hey, get him to the hospital. And we're like, what? You know, dad doesn't ever get sick. And so we loaded him up, took him to the hospital, and literally a week later he'd passed away. Mm. So, you know, now we're at the challenge of, you know, how do we take care of our mom and that kind of stuff? Because, you know, we were, we were lower middle income, so we didn't have a lot of money. So I pretty much was the – one that would stay home. Kids, you know, my brothers and sisters were, both brothers were in college. My sister was married, had, you know, a one-year-old. So I was kind of the chosen one to be the nurse and take care of my mom for the next year. And uh, At 14? Yeah, I was turned 15 now, yep. And so for from 15 to almost 16, I took care of her, and uh, then she passed away. But, you know, the neat thing was I got to spend a year with my mom, and she had a lot of faith. I mean, she would talk to me and read the Bible and, and talk to me about the Bible, tell me about end times. I mean, she was like preparing me, you know, hey, Scott, here's what you need to be doing. And we had conversations. We had candid conversations about, hey, I'm going to pass away, and here's how you need to live your life. Mm. And, you know, at 15, going to turn 16, she's telling me, hey, you need to move in with your sister. You know, she's 23. She's got a, you know, a newborn. And uh, so... You know, we talked and we had these conversations that, you know, when I pass away, this is what needs to happen. And she would share the Lord with me. And so when after she passed away, you know, my sister and I had a come to Jesus conversation. Mm-hmm. And I said, you don't want to raise a teenager and I don't want to be raised by my sister. Mm-hmm. Let's make an agreement. Let me get my own place. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how legal. Uh, yeah, I don't know how legal it was, but <laughs> I ended up getting my own not, place. Not very legal. <laughs> Those are, those are those are you know other you know older times. Yeah, but I think probably still not on the up and up on that one. Yeah, so you know, in a small town, I don't think anybody really cared. You know, they're like, okay, as long as I paid my bills. Yeah. So I ended up uh, actually, you know, my routine was I'd go to school, go to practice, football, wrestling, whatever it was, and uh, and then I'd go to work. And I worked. I kind of managed a. Uh, video game room, which is the greatest job for a teenager to have in Heck high yeah. school anyway. <laughs> Free so, video games. Yeah. So. You know, I do that till nine o'clock and then I worked at a uh, produce stand at the night. So they'd call me at two in the morning and say, Hey, you know, can you come and unload us? And I have watermelons, you know, cantaloupe, whatever. So I do that for two, three hours to make some extra cash. And that was my routine through high school. That's, and my goal was, you know, my ultimate goal was just to, you know, you, you mentioned earlier, what's your, what was your goal? Mine was to get out of a small town. Mm. Mine was, you know, better myself, you know, and looking around the city, I was like, I just, I got to better myself. So I got the opportunity to go to Ball State. So um, before we jump in that though, you, you, that, since I've known you, you, you have one of the most unstoppable work ethics of anybody I've ever met in my life, and it, it sounds like it it was there when you were 15 years old. Do you think that's something that that was instilled in into you by your dad, or do you just think maybe it's a gift that God's given you as a part of your personality? Where, where do you, what do you attribute that to? You know what. Um... My dad was a railroader, so I didn't get to see a lot of him. He was always traveling and on the road. Uh, my mom was, she was a, a strong force. You know, she was one, you're going to play sports, you're going to be involved. You know, she was the one that kind of pushed all of us boys to, to you know, drive and, and push. Um, but I think it's it's also the Lord just instilled, you know, something, just that ethic. Because, um, yeah, at, at a young age, it, was, it wasn't even a question. It's like, I got to do this to get, you know, just... This is what it is. Yeah. And so. But I don't want people, I don't want you to miss that if you're listening, is that a lot of us have dreams, but there's not a lot of us that are willing to work for them. And I, I don't know anything in life that comes easy. I know a lot of things that are worth it, but a lot of things I think that are worth it take a lot of effort and a lot of long-term uh, drive in that. And I do think it's something that, that the Lord has given you a gift to do. But, but I want you to miss that if you're listening to this. I mean, man, what, what is one of the main things that may be separating me from the things that God has in my life? Or what is one of the main things that maybe has me stuck where I'm at if I don't like where I'm at? It might be, just be that that you might not be willing to, to put in the work, right. and, and you've got to do that. Mm-hmm. So you get that, you get you head to Ball State. What happens next? So I get up to Ball State, and uh, after my sophomore year, I kind of run out of the cash. So, <laughs> you know, I was only able to accumulate so much. 
So I had a choice, you know, after my sophomore year, um, I need, I knew I need to go back to work somewhere, make some money and probably finish my degree. Um, and that was my goal. You know, I, I, that was my intentions to do that. So, you know, do I want to go back to Logan sport? I could probably room with a couple old buddies and get back into, you know, factory work and make some money there. But that wasn't my heart. And I said, I, you know, I just, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go to Indianapolis. And so I, I basically grabbed my clothes, backpack and thought, okay, I'll go down there and get a job tomorrow. And, uh, so I loaded up, took off to Indy, didn't know anybody. And, uh, it was a longer road than I thought. I ended up, you know, over a month basically on the streets and uh, nowhere to live, no food, just, you know, just survival mode. And it was, it was scary. It was rough, you know, and, and not knowing anybody. Um, but it was amazing through this time, you know, still not having that relationship with Christ. I really did trust in him for some reason. I just had that heart, mm. you know, I'd pray to him and Lord, you know, help me find a place to sleep tonight. Help me, you know, whatever. And so I really entrusted him, but and I think it was just my mom talking to me about the Bible and reading the Bible to me when I was younger. I never read the Bible after that. I've never read the Bible, you know, up to this stage. You know, I never opened up the Bible. And, uh, but I just had that faith and I would pray the Lord, you know, I need food or whatever. And he always provided. Mm. Through everything I've been through at this, you know, time of my life up to this point, he always provided. I, you know, and the great thing is, you know, as you get older, you can look back and go, wow, you can see the times that he intervened and, you know, as long as you stay true to him and, and try and make the right choice, you know, you know, the best you can um, and your heart's right, I think he can lead you down that path and, and really watched yeah. out for me. So, I totally agree, Scott. And I think one, I think one thing that I want I want you to listen to right now is that if you're at a place in your life where maybe you've you've found the Born to Be podcast, maybe you came from radio theology or or you just you liked one of our guests and you started listening, but you're at the point now where you're not sure you have faith in God, but you may but but if there's a plan, you'd like to find it. One of the misconceptions that I, that I love us to try to squash is people feeling like if they don't do all the right stuff or have a great relationship with God, that he's against them. And I mm-hmm. think one thing that I want people to know is God is always for you. Always. And he's always finding ways to, to, to woo you back or let you know, listen, I love you. I'm for you. You are created for this relationship. And so I love that for in that situation for you, Scott, that like really before you believed in him and had that relationship, like, he believed in you, yep. and he was at he was at work, and that and in his grace was there even before you had a, a connection. and And I want you to hear that if you're at a place right now where you're not sure you believe in God, I want you to hear from Scott's story that he believes in you right now more than you believe in him, and, and that may be the foundational step you need. So jump back in, Scott. Sorry. Well, and so you know, I finally did uh, find a job, great restaurant. Some may know about it. it was called Daltz, and it was at Keystone at the Crossing, and. You know, at that point, now, you know, really the second phase of my life had taken place, and that's where, you know, I get involved with this wonderful lady. So I might pass it over to Nyla and let her share a little bit about herself. So. Yeah. Yeah, Nyla, give, give us well, the— Well, I was uh, the totally opposite. I basically uh, was raised in a great Christian home, parents that love the Lord, grandparents that love the Lord. So I was raised with the Word and, you know, what how much God loved me. So I was on the totally different, um, you know— than Scott was. But then when I went to Butler, I, uh, you know, went to Butler, loved it and got a job at Dalt's. And I remember this kid would come flying into the restaurant and throw his clothes in the bun steamer to get the wrinkles out. And I thought, what's wrong with him? And you know, what's wrong with this kid? And so everybody said, I said, you know, what is wrong with him? But I kind of, his work ethic was so strong. And so my, I was raised that way too. I started corn to tasseling at 13 you know, my parents said, you got to work, you want things. So, but I saw this kid that was really a hard worker, but he, he was living on the streets mm. and I felt bad for him. I, you know, I thought, well, you know, you know, and we kind of got to talking and everything like that. And I finally asked one of the guys that, um, cause I had been at Dalt's for a long time and I asked, do you have an extra room? This kid needs a place to st- sleep. And so, um, he says, I have a den, you know, he can rent from him. So then Scott, we got you a room and we made a bet. I think we made a bet to go out, and so I think bet. I you lost. Were, well, you did. You were uh, <laughs> kind of grooving on a guy that played for uh, <laughs> I did. What was it, Syracuse uh, or something, yeah, and they I were was. in the Final Four, and I uh-huh. said, I bet against him, and I said, either way, I was going to win. I either bought dinner or I got dinner, so I got a date no matter what. <laughs> yeah, that is true. And uh, so it worked out pretty good. But, so it was uh, a bet if Syracuse lost in the in the, in the the tournament? Yeah, yeah, she lost, I won, if, if you know, and so I, I had, had to pay, buy. I had to take him out if, if they won. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Either way, it worked out. I got a date with her. Smart so man. It, it worked out good. But, uh, yeah, so. It know. was kind of a whirlwind, our, our, our life, because we met. I remember the first date. I remember going home saying, I think I could marry this guy. 
But right off he, the bat? Right off the bat. Right off the bat. I sat there, and I remember my Sunday school teacher always said, the way a man treats his mom is the way he'll treat you. And I listened to his story about the way he mm. nursed his mom and, you know, just had this heart passion for his mom. I thought, you know what? This guy has got such character, but he wasn't a believer. Mm. We talked about that the first state. But, um, you know, I was like, I, you know, my parents always said to me, we will not walk you down the aisle if you're, if you're, you know, people aren't believers. They have to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior before we walk you down the aisle. And so I thought, well, I got to hurry up and get this guy moving <laughs> along here because I kind of want, I kind of dig him. Yeah. But to make a long story um, short, Scott actually had some problems and um, he had been in and out of jail. And a bunch of my sorority sisters and I were going with our dates to this uh, Bengals game. And Scott was driving, did a did a U turn, got pulled it over. It was legal U turn. It was a legal U turn, yeah. but he <laughs> had some warrants out for his arrest. Handcuffed him right there and took him to jail. And he was facing quite a bit of time in jail. And I remember going back to my dad saying, "You've got to get this guy out. I love him. I want to marry him." My dad's like, "What in the heck is going on with your life and this kid?" So my dad actually hired a an attorney, went down and. Um, Said. The first impression was amazing because <laughs> that's the first time I met her dad. Get out of here. And uh, I had Mr. the. Pailey, I, it's great to meet you. Yeah. Uh, yes, and my name's so, Scott. I need yeah. some money. But he was my dad impressed. Yeah. Tell him and why. about your daughter. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I love your daughter, by the way. So tell him how you, what my dad met you. So what really impressed him was I, I just bought a new Well, vest, he had been in jail vest. before, so you got to remember this. He under, so he, and I bought a new sweater vest, and I thought I was looking dapper going to the Bengals game. Well, we're going to jail, and it's not a clean place. So I said, I'm going to flip this thing inside out. So when I come out, I'm going to turn on and be clean. And I'm not going to trash it. And I came out and I was all clean. All the other guys were dirty. And he was like, how do you stay clean? I said, I turned it inside out. I think that impressed him more than anything. <laughs> <laughs> so basically he got out of jail and uh, we eloped. We just kind of told my parents, we're done. We just want to elope. And so. Well, you know, and, and Darren, so the next phase, you know, was, it wasn't easy. Um, you know, Nyla got pregnant. Yeah. And we we weren't married, and we didn't expect this. And I remember looking at her and saying, you know, boy, this isn't the way I wanted to start it, you know. And I didn't mean it like that. I meant I want to oh, spend a year yeah. with you, and she's getting shocked. Are you kidding me? Yeah. And I'm no, like, no, I think no. twice about you now. But I, I, you know, I have no question going, you know, that I want to marry you, and I want to have these kids and everything. But uh, you know, it was a time in our life that another challenge comes about. All yeah. of a sudden, you get this little child that's coming around, and it's like, you know, what do we do? So. Right away, I said, I want to marry you. Let's get married. You know, let's do the right thing. And we did. But uh, it was interesting. I was reading Deuteronomy 524 the other day, and uh, it talked about how men uh, back in the day, when they first got married that first year, they were not allowed to go to war. Mm -hmm. They were not allowed to, to have any other duties. Their duty was to stay at home and make their wives happy. Now, yeah. that's pushing the envelope. But, yeah, you know, yeah. it's, you know. <laughs> That part, that last part, I'm not sure, but yeah. but no, it's so true. And the greatest thing that happened in our marriage is, you know, when we, you know, we had, by the age of 24, we had two kids. So all our friends kind of abandoned us. And for us, you know, it was actually a blessing to disguise. And I think today, and there's something with the Deuteronomy that I think that first year, these new couples don't have that time. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're trying to build their career and they're hanging out with their friends and, you know, you got the social media, you got so many things. And I, I feel for these young couples, you know, we've had seven weddings at our barn mm. in the first year, two of them ended in a divorce before the year was up. Wow. You know, that's sad. Yeah. And I, and to not even give a year commitment to your spouse and uh, be able to do that. But, you know, I just think that's so important. And so we were actually blessed that our friends, you know, kind of, uh-oh, we were like the plague. You, they got kids run, yeah. Yeah. you know. Yeah, be in their water. Yeah. <laughs> well, one thing I wanted to back up and tell you real quick is that, I did, we, um, when I knew I loved him, I said, Scott, you've, you'd really need the Lord. My parents yeah. won't walk me down the aisle if you don't accept the Lord. And I remember sitting in my driveway and you, we, I led you we to prayed. the Lord. Yep. I said, you know, we, you said the prayer to the Lord Jesus Christ and you accepted him. And, and that's, that was the turning that point. That was the turning in my point. Life. That's yeah. when I realized yeah. that's when that personal, I talked about that personal relationship, not having it before. And that's when it really started to grow. So, you know, now we got this new baby and, you know, and so we're able, and it was really just us being able to spend time together and focus on each other for that first year, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm working on my career, um, and I got the opportunity to get in management, you know, with, with adults, and she got shipped out, and, you know, I was 21, 22, um, and so, but we really were able to focus on that, and then we started getting in church and started, you know, getting into 
you know, ministering to the youths and the youth ministry. So we really got that, that triangle effect that as Nan and I both put Christ first, he pulled us closer together. And we didn't have any outside influences for that, you know, first year, two years. And I, I truly believe that foundation, yeah. we were able to build those first two years, was so superior to anything that we could have ever done. I, and I just look at the Lord and I thank him every day because that just really rooted us in. And, you know, we're 34 years later you know, and, and, uh, growing. So, well, and, and that's something that's been consistent for you guys. Like you don't see a lot of couples that, that stay together, a, but B work together. And, right. you know, now that you're, you've been, you know, a major part of the right. leadership and the, and the management Absolutely. of, of the Wolfie's restaurants, your kids are a part now. How, how, how is that? I mean, is that something, you know, as you guys came to Lord, as you begin to grow in those first years, did you, were you dreaming about that you would work together and start no. restaurants? Oh, or no. It, it, that wasn't a plan. It's an, no, we, we actually it, it was, had a, we had a, uh, Scott used to build golf courses for Pete Dye. So we had a railroad tie company at this barn. Well, then Pete Dye stopped using railroad ties because of the Curacao. So we ended up having this barn and I knew we, I mean, we lost more money than we thought we'd ever make. I just had to start working. So I started a farmer's market. And so through that, and you know, the one thing about, us is that you know we have no expectations on each other is that I need him to help me he needs me to help him and we've always kind of been you know when when we lost everything he had to go back to the restaurant business well I had to I had this barn I had to continue so it was kind of back and forth in that area and we've always been that way yeah and and it was it was so you know we're young I'm in the restaurant business I got an opportunity to open the Keystone Grill, did that. And I was living at that place, 100-hour work weeks. And, mm. you know, and so we got two young kids at home now. And she's like, if you're going to work this hard, why don't you work for yourself? And I'd always been looking at this company. I said, yeah. So was able to raise the money, buy this railroad tie company. And we evolved it. But like she said, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. You think, oh, management's management. Finances are finances. It's not. Mm-hmm. I got out of my realm, which is restaurant, yeah. into a landscape. Didn't know what I was doing. Lost my tail. Um, we ended up having to sell our house, moved back into a, a small condo, one-bedroom condo, sold our cars. I mean, we're back to ground zero. Mm. Um, and it was rough. It was challenging. And so, you know, we, we started out in our marriage with a newborn, you know, right off the bat. Mm. Then we've already, by the age of 28, have built and lost a company and lost more money than we ever thought we'd make, you know. So wow. you go through financial financial troubles, any relationship that goes through that. I remember the policeman knocking on our door and saying, hey, you know, we're, they're going to have to shut your utilities off. I mean, it was that bad. And uh, so I started working two jobs and doing whatever I could do. And, you know, Lord blessed me with opportunities to grow with great companies. And I got in with Applebee's and, and you know, Buffalo Wild Wings and, and some great restaurants that I really was able to grow and, and move up. And so through those things, I was able to learn the industry. And that's how you know, but it was through this process, it was all survival mode. Mm. It was like, okay, we got to open a business. Yeah. We got to keep this business going. You know, we got to pay down this debt. And we always said, Lord, if you allow us to retire all the debt, you know, that's what we want to do. We want to pay everybody back. So we went to our creditors and said, Hey, we'll pay you every penny, but you got to stop the bleeding, help us here. Mm-hmm. And they did, you know, they were, they were great. So we paid everybody, everything back Do We didn't, you know, we could have filed bankruptcy and that's what everybody was telling us to do. Just file bankruptcy, walk away from this. You guys are too deep into it. And it took us 10 years to retire the debt, to pay everybody back, clean everything up. And through that process, we still have vendors now that are like, you guys are the greatest. You know, it's, mm-hmm. you know, nobody, people don't pay back There's a trust everything. There. Yeah. yeah. So it, it was, it was a rough road. So, you know, you go with those things. So we went through the you know, new baby at the beginning and then you go through a financial and, you know, people say, well, you don't understand what I'm going through. Boy, we've been through the financial aspects of it. We've been through, you know, having a newborn right at the beginning. We've had trials and tribulations. But if you keep your eyes on the Lord, mm. it's amazing. Um, and you just, like Nyla said, she alluded that if we, you know, it's not about me, it's not about her. It's about what I can do for her and what she could do for me. It's what we do for each other to support each other. And that's why it, it, it works. And then just putting the Lord first, it all falls in place. Mm. So where did it all start with with taking the step to then start Wolfie's, which now, like I said, you've got five Wolfie's locations here locally, and then you've got the Italian house uh, that's doing great as well. Where, where did it come to say, hey, you know what? We're going to put our name on a place, and we're going to start our own our own. Place. That actually started. We um, we were down in Castleton, had that nursery, got out of that because the land was sold. So we we found a place in Noblesville, Five Point Intersection in Noblesville, and we started Nyla's Cafe. So Nyla ran that. I was working full time in the industry, in the restaurant industry. So she was running, and so it was a cafe, 
um, and a, a flower shop and all this. It was really a unique, fun place. We had pancakes bigger in your head and all that. So, you know, it was just one of these things that kind of evolved into this thing to just pay down debt. That's why we did it. Yeah. Well, landlord, after five years being there, said, hey, you guys are doing so well. We're going to double your rent. And we said, hey, don't think so. Mm. So we started looking, or we would have never looked. And that's when I found the Noblesville location on the water. And I looked at that, and I said, I'll tell you what, honey, this restaurant will, you know, put us on the map. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is the one that will really help us, you know, I'll help you get this thing going. Well, I didn't have a lot of time to help her. I was going cruises and doing all that kind of stuff, important things. And she was running (laughs) the show, you know. (laughs) But, uh, and that's really where it started. You know, it was that opportunity up on Morris and we really devoted, I mean, we did all the work interior ourselves and, you know, really kept the overhead down. And so it grew and, and then, uh. So I worked there for three years while Scott stayed with Applebee's to pay down debt. Yep. So I would work, you know, gosh, 80, 100 hours. And I had two kids and still in high school. But, you know, we just couldn't take the money from the restaurant. So we knew he had to stay at Applebee's and take that income to help pay off the debt. And, um, you know, that was kind of it. But it wasn't until I think, you know, finally after three years, our son, you know, started getting in a little bit of trouble because I wasn't home and he was traveling Monday through Friday. I just said, something's got to break. You, we have got to take the leap. You know, our family means more to us. And I was sitting in New York. I remember this, you know, point blank, sitting there at Fargo de Chao, downtown New York. My phone rings. I'm like, that's not good. It's, you know, seven o'clock at night. Mm. Excuse myself, walk out. And I let, just says, I'm done. You mm-hmm. know, can't do it. I like got in trouble again, our son, and uh, he's a good kid. But when you're not at home at night, mm. neither one of the parents, mm-hmm. who's he going to hang out? What's he going to do? Yeah. And uh, so he started hanging around the wrong crowds and doing the wrong choices and things like that. And so I came back to the table, looked at my boss and said, turn my notice in. And uh, that was it. And so, you know. Just like that. That that was it. She called and I said, I'm done. I'm, I'm going back. And uh, so I came back and that's been, you know, how long has I been now? 14 years something like that so but uh you know it was one of those that i just knew it was the right thing to do you know and it's it's hard to leave i was making good money you were traveling all traveling all the time going on cruises and doing that kind of stuff i had i had a great life but she's at home working her tail off trying to build this business and i knew it was the right thing to do and you know you walk away from you know the income the insurance the benefits and all those things um it's kind of scary but you know it was one of those things i i knew it was the right thing to do and so and I also knew Scott could take it to the next level. I'm just a people person. I don't know systems. I'm I'm not. The, I am better now, but back then I just knew that I was just the people person. I knew from all the people from my cafe would come find me up there, so I kept it going. But it got to be so big, I couldn't do it. I just said, Scott, it's getting so big, and you know, either we have to hire some people. I was managing, cooking, bartending. <laughs> I said, I need help. So that's yep. when you know we figured, okay, Scott can come back. Mm-hmm. We can make it work. And so, you know, it didn't. So I came back and we got that thing going and, and uh, we were paying down the debts and cleaned everything up. And uh, we just, I happened to be driving by, we were driving through the parking lot at the Fisher's location and it was closed. It was an old Schlosky's Deli. Mm. And I looked in the eye and I said, this could be a really cool little pub. And the next thing you know, but it, through this process, Darren, we didn't have the money. And I, I got to go back how the Lord worked and intervened in this process was he gave us such favor you know, um, going back to Morris, you know, I didn't have the money to buy that place, but I had met the landlord. The landlord actually came into Nyla's cafe and scouted her out, you know, and she calls me and I'm out of town again. And she's like, there's this creepy guy walking around the store and just <laughs> hanging out all day. What do I do? And I said, well, ask him who he is. It was actually the landlord on the Morris Lake. He was seeing, checking us out, had heard about us. And, uh, so we met, and I walked in and I said, yeah, it's great. I love the location. I'd love to have it. And got one problem. And he's like, what's in? I said, I don't, I don't have the money, you know, and I don't know if a bank will loan me money because 90% failure rate in the restaurant industry yeah. is not a good thing to go <laughs> yeah. to the bank with. Tough sell. Yeah. <laughs> so banks usually kind of run from that. Yeah. And uh, the Lord gave us favor and, and he said, fine, what do you need? And I said, here's the amount. And he said, done deal. You know, here, let's set up a loan and I'll bank you. And same thing happened when I went to the Fisher's location. Get out. And so that was the Lord. There's no way I could have went and built this on my own. You know, financially, couldn't have done it without partners. My only partner is my wife and the Lord. And well, that's Scott, how we're blessed. I love that. But let's talk about this for a second because 
I get it. I mean, I you know somehow I become the pub pastor here in Indy, right? And yep. I go to bars and tell people about Jesus. But for a, a lot of traditional folks, they'd be saying, "Now wait a second. You just said that you, you found this little part that you thought little you know place that could be a great little pub. You guys have restaurants. It's Wolfie's you know bar and grill. You serve alcohol like." What if, what would you say to somebody who maybe they're, they're have a more of a conservative approach and be like, well, I don't think the Lord would have given you money to, you know, to open I, a bar. That's a good, that's a great question. And what had happened is I struggled with that because I was raised, you know, you know, no drinking. I was raised that way. But I remember I was on the tennis court and my pastor's wife was playing against me and I, I we were talking and she said, I said, um, she goes, I heard your thing about buying that restaurant on Morris Lake. And I said, yeah, we're thinking about it. I said, but, you know, it's alcohol and stuff. And she goes, time out, Nyla. She goes, if Christians don't go into where the, where the non-believers are, who's going to do it? She said, I think you need to do that. She goes, you know, you really need to go into the darkness, but you need to keep your faith strong. And that really hit me. And I came home to Scott and I said, we're to do it. You know, because I struggled with it. We, she did. I was like, I don't know if we should be selling alcohol, but you know what? I guess the thing of it is, is really, we do have such a uh, strong foundation, and we, those people are who we want to minister to. They yeah. need the Lord just like a lot of other people, but because we have them in our place, we have them captivated. <laughs> we can hold them there. So, well, and that's, But that's, that's a core value for you guys, isn't it? The, it the, is. you, the people that work for you, they're not, they're not numbers. They're not Mm-mm. just employees. Right. Y- you see your, your staff as your family, but, right. but also as, as God's gift to, as your ministry. Yes. Mm-hmm. And they are our ministry. I mean, they can't ever come to us and say, you don't know what we're going through. And I can say, he lost his dad. We've been in debt. We've done it all. You have to just, and I always, when they, you know, cry to us, I always say, well, how's your life working for you? Because it looks awful. Mm. You know, you might just try Jesus for a week and see what happens (laughs) because I don't want your life. You know, you tried everything. It sounds awful. (laughs) You know, and they're like, okay, well, you know, and so we have little pamphlets we'll give them, but we do take them in and we do, um, you know, that's, that's kind of my gift is the people. I just, I love our employees. I love so we always close the restaurants down a couple times a year just to dedicate for them. So August 13th, we have this, we close all the restaurants down and we just, you know, show them how much we love them that day. Give them, you know, to prizes and stuff like that. And then we do it again at Christmas. And so they know we don't have turnover. And, well, and, you, and you, you, you invite them to your home. We right. invite them to your we property. And right. that's, I mean, that's, un, I, yeah. I don't know if it's unheard of, but I don't hear of it a lot. Yeah. Of, of, you know, owners and, and operators saying, hey. You can come be a part of right at my place, you know, and yeah. you can sit on my couch. You can be in my backyard. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the neatest thing, Darren, is, you know, we we don't, everybody knows where we stand. We don't force it on anybody. And, and we just, we have it out there. They know our, they know our hearts. And they know that, you know, we just love them. And uh, no matter what they're going through or what their lifestyle is or whatever. But some of the neatest things, and I will come home and share with me. And, and just you know, about a month ago, she got back in the restaurants. And we had two, I think, new girls that had worked and never talking to Nyla, never met her, and walking up to Nyla and, and saying, you know, hey, I'm going through this and talking to Nyla and actually asking, can you can you pray for me? Mm-hmm. You know, and the girl's not a Christian. She's not been around, but she knows there's something there. And I'll tell you, those are the times that you just, and she'd come back and we'd pray. And, you know, now it's opened that door for even more dialogue. And it's just really cool to see these kids, you know, they're searching. You know, I'll be honest with you, and, you know, to have that opportunity to be able to, to help them in any manner and, and kind of lead them down that path is is just such a, uh, a blessing for us. Hmm. So. I love it. I love it. You know, one of the things that, that I think is, is consistent, you know, we talk about, you know, in, in our spiritual DNA, a workshop about helping people find their voice or their role. And, and I believe that the, the, the Bible teaches that God has created each one of us to either be an apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, or a teacher. And that app, the, the apostle, another word there is pioneer. And, you know, I really believe, Scott, that, that who you were born to be, that you were on, put on earth to be an entrepreneur, a pioneer. And you've had a lot of different adventures in it, but that has been your base. You know, something goes great, then it fails. You go back to, what do I do? I start new things. I'm an entrepreneur. And God has created you in that. And what I love in, in, and what I want you to understand if, if, as you're listening right now is, is God may have created you that way, and you may be stuck in the job right now. You may be in one of the most painful places of your life, but if you can zero in to who God's created you to be and step into that role, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but you're going to see God to begin to open doors and do things that just don't make sense around you uh, because he needs people that are entrepreneurs. He needs pioneers to begin new things because I look at your guys' life, the restaurants, the companies, the the amount of jobs that you've created, the amount of blessing you brought to other people's families uh, monetarily, job-wise, career-wise. And then 
on top of that, knowing that you guys are leading with your faith and in, in, in your in, in your core understanding of, of what God's done in your life, you're you're inviting people into that eternal relationship as well, which I think a lot of entrepreneurs and, and business people they struggle to know where 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 does the business stop and my yeah. faith start? And right. you guys have found a way to 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 inter you know to interweave that. And we've been doing pub theology with you yeah. guys for which years, which has been we've, great. We've, you know, you've dreamed up the the restaurant industry Bible study, which. We've tried a couple different iterations, and we're still trying to figure still out working that out to, to make it what it needs to be. But how have you guys tried to balance that? Of of where does my faith stop and start? I, mean, I think about you guys paying back the debt. Right. I mean, that's allowing the, the word of God and in your, in your word and honesty to be something that you carry through. But what are some other ways that you've tried to make sure that that that's integrated? Um, I think our family is a big thing. I think the fact that you know we're still together if that's what you're talking about. We're still together. Our kids work in the business. They have respect for us. They understand it. Um, they're not lazy. I think, you know, that that helps too. And I think the fact that so many of these kids come from broken homes, they live on the, a lot of them are just really messed up. They want what we have. And, you know, when they, they see us, we always say it's because of the Lord. Yeah. You know, you've got to, you got to, you, the Lord's the only thing that will give you hope and peace. What we've talked about before on Radio Theology is there's, I think, I think there's um. Oftentimes, believers will edit their conversations when they're not talking to someone they feel safe with or feel like, mm. well, this is a Christian. I can say something like you just said. So I'm going to edit my response. Like, how do you guys do it? Oh, well, we just work hard is maybe what you would say to a non-Christian or somebody yeah. that you think might judge your belief. What I know from being around you guys for years now is you don't edit your conversations no. around your employees. No. You know, and we've got, you know, every aspect of people that work for us. And they're like, well, you can't talk to that person that way because, you know, they're from this whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. We, we, whatever the situation is, we're, we're a glass house. We say it the way it is, and we don't judge people, but, hey, this is, this is how it works. And, you know, to be part of our company, you, we've got to be this way. And I don't know. It's just one of those things that. Um, we love them where they are. Yeah. Real, whether but you're they're, right. We what, don't you know, edit yeah. our conversation. Whether they're them. alcoholics, whether they're homosexuals. We love them where they are, and they know they have our trust. Yeah. And we may not agree with their lifestyle, but they know that we do love them. Well, I know there was a time, you know, Scott, it's been a, a couple of years ago, I think, that, you know, you had a, you had a connection with, with somebody that was, you know, really struggling with, with substance abuse. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, you called me and said, hey, how can we, how can we get together like an intervention here? And, and you didn't send this guy somewhere. You sat down and were there and put a group of people around to help come around this person and give them an opportunity to make a change, you know what I mean? Do you think some of that is just you saying the way that God never gave up on you and all those different times? Is that something that has set that foundation for you? I, 100%, 100%. You know, he's always been there with me, and, you know, and I was fortunate that, you know, somehow I just, that faith was in me. But to help these kids, and you're exactly right, you know, we had a, a kid that was working with us and, you know, struggling uh, with opioids and going – we saw him going down that path. He started entering the level of stealing and all those things. And uh, I had had a conversation with him probably six months prior and just said, brother, what's what's going on, you know? And he's not a believer. And I just said, you know, I, I can tell something's going on and, you know, I'll pray for you. But if you need anything, if we can help, let us know. And that resonated with him so much that when we came back, I said, guys, you know, we need to do him as his buddies. We need to do something for him. we gotta, we got to do an intervention. And, uh, he basically just said, Scott, because of that conversation we had six months ago, because I wouldn't be here today, I wouldn't have shown up if it wasn't you having that conversation with me then, that just set a precedence that you really did care about me, you know, and now I'm six months later and I'm not in good shape. And now the kid is, you know, moved back home. He's, he's doing great. He's clean. He's got a great job. And it's just neat to see that. But it's just that love for these people. We, you know, we love these people. We, we want to see them, you know, go to heaven. We want to see them. You know, we've had – you know, young kids die, you know, from being in our, our business. And that's that's the toughest thing that what I don't want is somebody to have that opportunity to accept Christ and get to heaven, yeah. you know. And that's where we just, we have a heart for that. And if we can, you know, share that, that's what we're here for. Well, I, we talk a lot here on the podcast about the connection between uh, pain and passion. That oftentimes pain can, uh, pain can sometimes be something that people def- allow to, dev- to define themselves. I am my adversity. I am my pain. And, you know, I want to encourage you, if you're listening right now, to, to, to see from Scott and now the story for Scott is, Scott, you could have said, I was an orphan basically at, you know, at 15. 
You know what I mean? All, all these different things. I was in jail, you know, before I was 21. You know what I mean? I was, you know, got my girlfriend pregnant before I was married. Like, you can go through the list. Oh, I, I failed in my, you know, in my first entrepreneur. All these things you could say. But what I, what I see in you is you've taken the things that have been most painful and you've allowed, you've allowed your relationship and your faith with Christ. To that, that pain has now become the crucible for some of your greatest places of passion. And when, I, when I've been around you guys and as you're telling the story, I know that, that family is absolutely foundation for you guys. Yep. And, you know, that's, that came from the fact that the pain you've gone through, you know what I mean? And being able to be there for your son, be there for your daughter, be there for your grandkids, you know what I mean? Be there for your wife. And so some of those painful things for you guys, I, I can see that God has used them to allow them to be your passion. Yeah. And it's the way you guys lead your restaurants. It's the way you lead your family. Uh, it's an absolute inspiration. So as you wrap up, what would be somebody maybe, maybe you're talking to, I'd love to hear from both of you. Maybe you're talking to, um, you're talking to, to, to Scott Wolf, the, the, maybe the, the 19 year old version of yourself. And, and Nyla, maybe you, maybe go back to that same, that same place in life. If you could go back right now and say something to, to you at 19, seeing your life now, what would, what would you say to, to 19 year old Scott? You know, it, it goes back to, you know, just never give up, you know, um, trust in the Lord, you know, and, and really, you know, that personal relationship. I wish I'd even seen that earlier. Yeah. Just open up the Bible, understanding who Christ is and what he's talking about. You know, I remember the first book I opened was Proverbs and, and I've done that with my son. You know, I've said, Hey, Alec, you know, you know, open Proverbs, it's a great thing for men to read and understand. And that's a great place for me, was for me to start. But, you know, just really uh, surrounding yourself with Christ first and, and, and putting your time into that, building that one-on-one relationship with him, but then also understanding that he's with you through anything, good times, bad times, you know. But if you understand that even in the bad times he's with you, that it's, you know, I always looked at it as what's he teaching me? What do, what do I have to come out of this? What am I going to be better? How am I going to better myself for Christ? And so if you learn it and you have that mindset of he's never against you, you know, he's always for you. He's rooting for you. He's up or come on, you know. And if you have that mindset as opposed to he's against me and, you know, he's penalizing me, you know, that that's, you know, the wrong way in my vision to look at. I think you look at it as what do I learn from this? How do I get better? You know, I would encourage any 19-year-old to say, you know what, keep keep fighting it and and uh, just put Christ first and understand that he's always for you. Even in bad times, it could be a learning moment. So it. take it with that kind of attitude, and I think everything has a brighter light to it. Mm. Nala, what about you? I think that I think the kind of the same thing. You know, I always grace. I just, you know, I'm very, was raised very performance-oriented, and I have to remind myself every day that God's grace is so sufficient. So, you know, um, we're gonna, you're always going to have trials, and even to this day, I struggle a lot with, Maybe some things somebody may have said mean or the customers or something. I just have to remember that God does care. He's always there for me. And at 19, I, you know, I wish I, you know, I hope that uh, people understand how much God does love them. And basically the foundation is you've got to know the word because mm. the word will really set you free. Mm. I love it. I love it. Listen, uh, I know you've been inspired by Scott and Nyla's story. And, um, and if you're looking for mentors, people that you can look up to, uh, Scott and I are those kind of people. And I want you to hear the principles of the things they've talked about in this episode because they're not specific to them. They're they're applicable to everyone's story, whatever you're going through. And listen, if you're in the Indianapolis area listening, get over to any of the Wolfie's Grill locations, <laughs> Carmel, Fishers, uh, Noblesville up in, uh, off of Morris and the brand new one uh, on Geist, great location. And then, then the Italian house. Uh, if you're from around the world or listening around the country, if you come to Indianapolis or something, maybe you come for the 500. You got to get up there you go. And, and go to a Wolfie's. Uh, their food is amazing. Their service is great, and maybe you'll get a chance to sit down and uh, and talk and meet Scott and Nyla. But guys, I can't thank you enough for what you've meant to our ministry uh, for telling your story. I know it's going to be inspiring to so many people that are listening. Uh, Scott and Nyla Wolf, it's been another amazing episode uh, that I uh, felt just honored to be a part of here on the Born to Be podcast. Uh, God bless you. Have an amazing, amazing uh, week. And we'll, uh, we'll see you in the next episode.
Thank you for listening to the Born to Be podcast, where we believe you were created on purpose and for a purpose. Each week, we continue to deliver inspiration and interviews with today's top thought leaders who are living out their unique calling every single day. Be sure to catch us on Sunday with our next episode. Are you ready to discover your true identity and become who you were born to be? Then follow us on Facebook and Twitter. The Born to Be podcast, the future's yet to be created with your host, Darren Earlywine.